along the shore the cloud waves breaks, the twin suns sink behind the lake, the shadow lengthen in Carcosa. Strange is the night where black stars rise, and strange moons circle through the skies, but stranger still is Los Carcosa. Songs that Hades shall sing, where the flap, the tatters of the king, must die unheard in dim Carcosa. Song of my soul, my voice is dead, die though unsung, as tears unshed shall dry and die in lost Carcosa. Welcome to the Mind Deck Books podcast, another episode. My name is Philip. I never introduce myself, not like uh, I would need any introduction, I'm always here. And I want to say I'm a man of many issues. Recently, the most relevant issues are that I speak too quickly and my microphone's too far. And I also sound too tense, so I'm gonna shove my microphone down my throat. I'm gonna... That'll make you mumble more. Extra slow <laughs> and I'm going to chill and just try to vibe out this podcast with Paul and Christina coming back. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hello. I'm happy to, to be here. To introduce here. Paul. <laughs> yeah, you're very happy. You're definitely a huge improvement on this show. Uh, Christina has been uh, working on a translation of a very interesting book lately. How is it going? Or have you started yet? No, I haven't. I have to do another oh, okay. one. Uh, another one first. Uh, the sequel to the horrible one. Oh, no. Yeah, so. so Christina has been working on a really bad translation. <laughs> and next, coming up, yeah. even you're going to get a dedication from the writer and... Uh, Title sounds really nice. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna not, not like a dedication from the writer. I'm going to have like my own text about the translator in, in the book, which is quite even nice. better. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's uh, looks like it's going to be quite a nice book, quite a difficult book to translate. I'll have to learn a lot. You more said very surprising things about it. Could you tell us a bit what it is? So uh, the book that I'm very excited to translate is called Sonnenkönig Pechabe, and it is uh, written by. Oh my god, I hope I don't say his name wrong. Uh Kai Spellmeyer. I think I think that's I think that's the name. Sorry, Mr. Uh, author. <laughs> I, 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 I've just got started on the book and it's just a very interesting uh it's it's really nicely written. Like the the way it starts, like the vicar fell and died. And I was like, Yes, this is good. The vicar fell and died. And <laughs> And uh, it's uh, set in the 19th century in the world of, uh, you know, the kind of aristocratic uh, Britain with the balls and everything. But mm -hmm. this, uh, it's it's kind of playing on this Bridgerton trend with like the the period becoming popular again. But this is going to be a story about two men falling in love. And it's really nicely written, and uh, I'm really excited to to translate it. I'm a bit apprehensive about translating uh, the sexy times, but, uh, you know. <laughs> You've got all the experience now, so you, you, you're very qualified after the other books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they, they weren't. Uh, it wasn't particularly raunchy. The other books, it was just grossly written. So, uh, so, it, so. I was like, yeah, mm. like well, present tense, first person point of view is not a good good style for writing porn. It's just not. It, it's yeah. I don't even remember if the dinosaur porn was in in, in first person or not. I was trying to just push it out of my head as fast as possible. That I worked on. But... Yeah, I know, I know. It's a good test for porn. <laughs> What's I mean? I want to congratulate you that you got a nice job and sounds yeah. like it's the best of I... all worlds. It's like the yeah, I'm... ideal thing to do. Uh, on our cycle of aliens, depression and real men, uh, what what is Christina's deal? I, do you have an idea, Paul? Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Christina, we, we talked about our literally preferences. And every time I read a book, I, I'm like, are there aliens? Where are the aliens? Paul reads a book. He wants men. He says, are there rough, tough men? And with Paolo, he wants depression. He wants to be depressed. So if he's not sad after the book, he doesn't like it. So that's our cycle of books. Yeah. We always have one of these. Okay. And then what's your deal? I'm curious. He likes smut. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to deny Obvious. that I've read my fair share of fan fiction. Uh, I'm not going to deny that. Uh, but I 
like aliens, I guess. Uh, real men, I guess it very much depends on what you consider to to be real and and male. Uh, yeah, and uh, what was it? Depression? Yeah. Oh no. More like existential depression. Ex no, I, 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 I would prefer not to. <laughs> Listen to our stranger episode from Albert Camus. That was fun. To I discuss. quite like uh, books that are funny. I like books that are kind of interesting and hmm. in some way. Yeah. Anything it is, you're a very welcome distraction from our cycle of alien depression men. So please. <laughs> All right. So today we are discussing a collection of short stories that Paul chose. And actually they're not about real men. They're more about madness, I guess. Mm. And uh, <laughs> it's called uh, The King in Yellow and other horror stories. We're going to focus on the first four stories that are connected. The other ones are kind of connected, but not so much. Not really. No. I knew nothing about this, so I went completely blind into it. Uh, Paul told me he's got lots to say, and I'm very, very curious. So how did you like this collection of stories? It's by, oh, damn it, I forgot, Robert, Robert Chambers. W, w Chambers, thank okay, you Robert very much. W Chambers, mm -hmm. excuse me. Mm -hmm. So how did you like it? Christina? Oh, you're asking me. Uh, Anybody who wants um, to say. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to start out all negative, but I, I have to. I didn't. I didn't like it. Uh, and I, I just do like kind of a disclaimer. I think it's perfectly okay to like this, the book, the stories, to enjoy them and to find them valuable. Uh, however, it, they filled me with disappointment and anger. And I am, if you want, I'm quite ready to tell you to, you know, let me count the ways. I am prepared to tell you how and why. <laughs> okay. Wow! But you enjoyed it, Paul, right? That's why you. Yeah, I love this. Uh, I, I love the first four stories. I am. I kind of in between. I uh, wanted to say I see now why Paolo hates short stories, because he always says when we when we do a short story on the podcast that he doesn't like it's not deep or developed enough, and the characters don't have space to do anything and all this. I never felt like this, but I have to agree with Christina here. It's kind of left me hoping for more, wishing for more. I think the. The book does a good thing of giving you enough that it allows your imagination to that's kind of true. fill in the blanks. And that's what I quite like about it. The spaces like of things that are very intriguing and mysterious and kind of loosely connected. But he, yeah, he doesn't fully flesh it out. It's a short story, of course. So. I actually liked parts of it. So I didn't like, I wasn't bored. I wasn't angry. I wasn't disappointed. Uh, it was interesting to ponder about some of the things. But at the same time, it wasn't enough. I guess to be. I think that's fascinating. I really don't understand why you guys I explain it. I oh. but like no, okay, I'm, I'm really curious to you... see what you got out of it because I, I, uh, me I too, really me too. want to know. Maybe you'll change our mind completely, like mm. we turned your mind around with Piranesi. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one thing that's really surprising is <laughs> this was written in 1895, and it's very easy to read in English that's for an old book. No, well, yeah, huh? it's very easy You're to read. And one thing that I kept okay. thinking about is that it kind of went over my head and I felt really dumb. I, I actually reread re or listened to the first story and I think the last one again because I felt like I didn't get it. <laughs> like I'll talk about it later. I have some questions I need to be explained. And Paul told me it's your problem. It, it's not the book. <laughs> Jokingly. I think in the whole kind of Lovecraftian kind of universe and society or fans, I, this is really popular book, you know, the weird tale genre. This is up there with one of the best stuff. So I was really surprised how many things it influenced. Like there's a movie mm. and uh, there are references to it in video games and TV shows. Uh, yeah, it's uh, True Detective, the first season. I really like that show. Have you seen that, by the way? The HBO True Detective? Yeah. I watched the first season because it's uh, based on the, uh, well, loosely based on The King in Yellow. 
elements of it. Mm -hmm. And it's also like inspired a bunch of SCP foundation studies. I mean, to ask you how much of a nerd you are, guys. I have no idea what you're talking about. SCP, it's a shortcut or abbreviation of Secure, Contain and Protect. No idea. It's a, like a fan-made archive of cryptids, paranormal incidents and like nonsense, basically heard about that so uh, yeah so the the book king in yellow or the yellow uh, symbol or yellow sign is, yellow sign yeah is part of this like archive of things that might have existed and might have been real and they have been confiscated and contained and uh, in a conspiracy just like tries to pretend that it's not a real thing uh, anyway like paul mentioned it's very similar to lovecraft kind of style of stories i think this is a bit more accessible though than Love lovecraft's a bit verbose sometimes have you ever read anything lovecraft christina uh, i haven't i know the general knowledge information about lovecraft there's these old gods uh, you know mm. uh, and I, I've, i've never I've never read anything by him yeah so i wasn't really comparing it to lovecraft when i was reading i was uh, i was comparing it to edgar Allan poe oh yeah um. and coming up short <laughs> <laughs> shots fired <laughs> The mm -hmm. interesting thing about Chambers was that these four stories were the only kind of like horror or supernatural ones he wrote. He became more famous for like being the the old sort of Daniel Steele kind of romance writer. That that's what he made money from. Okay, mm. interesting. So, so that's why Lovecraft wrote an essay uh, called Supernatural Horror in Literature, mm. which was like a 28,000 word essay. Mm. And he made the comment about Chambers that uh, Chambers is like a few other fallen titans, equipped with the right brains and education, but wholly out of the habit of using them. That's so. harsh. <laughs> so obviously Lovecraft quite liked this, but he didn't really like the other well, stuff that he like came up with. And... He was too good for, for trashy romance. Well, it, Lovecraft has zero romance in his stories because he was probably incapable of imagining anything like that himself actually i also found about chambers that he sold illustrations in magazines and he lived in munich and paris and i was surprised yeah he studied at uh, one of the famous art academies in paris uh he lived there for a while a very interesting thing about chambers actually he really didn't like the impressionist but if you ever look at his art it kind of looks like impressionism <laughs> so <laughs> the irony is <laughs> yeah the information you can there's not much information on him no one's really done any kind of biography of chambers or things like this um hmm. probably if lovecraft didn't come back to popular culture probably chambers would have just sort of disappeared into hmm. the abyss so lovecraft kind of brought him back as well i liked all the ideas in the i like the the setting i like the background i like the characters i like the Like the madness aspect of it, I guess that's what the appeal is. Like the the mm -hmm. horror of descending into madness, which is most of the Lovecraft stories. Yes. And it left me wanting something else. In the same way, the Lovecraft stories always leave me. I I I wanted I wanted to go somewhere, and it kind of doesn't. And that's what like if it was as twice as long and it more things happened, then I would be happy. I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay. But I didn't hate it. I, I I enjoyed it. It wasn't. It didn't overstay its welcome at all. I just. I guess it was good because it let it left me wanting more, and I was really intrigued. But then at the same time, I was like, okay, what 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 should I take out of this? Like especially the first story. I hope you you tell me what I should take out of that because I'm so confused. <laughs> I was like, damn it, am I that dumb? What happened? <laughs> like. Okay. I, I thought the first story is quite easy to follow. Okay. But... Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> The first story was the one I kind of enjoyed the most out of all of them. I'd say so too. Uh, but it also kind of... So I liked the ambiguousness of how legit Wild is uh, as like what Hildred imagines him to be. Because it's kind of like, is he really this this powerful, capable man? Or is he a lunatic just like Hildred? I liked that. And... <laughs> um, Um, the narrator in the first story is completely nuts. He's crazy. So he, he can't be trusted on what he's saying, actually. Yeah, that made me super confused. I was just... I... Yeah, we'll talk about it in the spoiler part, I guess. Okay. 
I was I was hoping that something would happen with the setting. I was quite let down on on me too, because me too. like he the the way it's introduced, it's the it's like the perfect fascist utopia, you know, United States in mm. in that in that world. And then nothing is done with that at all. And maybe in some <laughs> of the other stories like like besides these four, but it just doesn't doesn't use it in any way other than say so basically united states is a nightmare now uh without actually acknowledging that yes it would be a nightmare for that for that to be a reality uh with all the hmm. you know i agree okay yeah. i'm gonna die on this hill so defending this <laughs> oh. <laughs> you look perfect to me <laughs> so before we move on uh, mm. would you recommend this to people yes of course no <laughs> No. I think Philip. I would say yes, because it's really easy to read. I very much agree about the language being very accessible and okay. it's kind of nicely written. And if you look at it, just to defend the book a little bit, if you look at it in the sense of the feeling or the mood it puts you on and the setting and like the concept of it, it's interesting. It's, it's enjoyable in the sense of setting a mood or like a mindset, how to say. Mm. I like it. I, I, I didn't. You, you might enjoy it. I don't know. I didn't. It really didn't. I would like, okay, you want to be put in a creeped out, scary mood. Paul will do that so much better. And it's like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not difficult to read. It's, you know, you, you might, mm -hmm. you might learn a few words, maybe. I don't know. But that's good, right? Maybe we should try that. I've never read anything. Though. It's anything. like, I, his stuff. I was kind of saying it's difficult to read. later, but like a short story that is short and like guaranteed to kind of freak you out because it, it freaks me out still whenever I think about it. It's called Berenice <laughs> and uh, okay. oh, it is, it is crazy. It is like quite uh, graphic and, but in a way that's not, not like in your face, blood spurting everywhere, mm -hmm. but oh yeah. It's, uh... Okay, we should try that sometime. I, I'm, I'm interested. So I would recommend it. I say if you love Lovecraft, definitely read it. If mm. you are curious about Lovecraft or if you like in these kinds of stories, you, you, there's nothing to lose and you should give it a chance, I think. It's not, it's not very long as well. It's, it's not very like wasting your time. It, so yeah. Yeah, if you're at least so curious, I'd recommend it. So, mm. yeah. And it's very different. Like I haven't read anything much like that. Mm. Like, the, I mean, the setting and the, the characters and all this, so... Yeah, I have read similar stuff, but uh, yeah, it's it's like I haven't read Lovecraft, but if you enjoy Lovecraft, like they say, maybe you may enjoy this if you like this kind of yeah fiction. Okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely Lovecraft fans. It's so, it's right up your alley. Yeah. So let's move into the second part, I guess, to completely spoil it. If you if you want to read this, stop now, please. Come back after you've read it. If you just want to know what it's about. Keep listening and uh, we're gonna describe the first four stories. So the first story is called The Repairer of Reputations. It's very curious about his name. Yeah, and also uh, it's a very important point that the first four stories are kind of loosely connected by this book called The King in Yellow, which is a play that is not performed. And uh, this book has been banned and governments have tried to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And if you read the book or you read the second chapter, you basically go insane. Yeah. So, <laughs> we didn't go insane, uh, hopefully. But that's basically the necro necronomicon. <laughs> it's the same thing. I, that, yeah, that's, that's what I like... didn't like about it. I was intrigued, and I liked it. That I I was intrigued at the start. Yeah. Okay. Then, then it turned out that oh, it is actually just a book that makes you crazy to read. Not not like it's not a banned book. It's it's not a book that's banned for any of the ideas it presents. It's just like you you begin to read it and then poof. There you go. You'll be on saving now. <laughs> there you go. Might just lie down and die. But the book is actually banned in some places. Is it? It is mentioned, like in France, the government has banned it and things like this. Because it is very dangerous. Yeah. I just not. It's not like, you know, in history, we have had people or doctors a long time ago trying to ban books because they said, this. if you read this book, you would possibly go insane. So it's not, it's not a weird they actually do go insane and i'm like yeah like, all books can be read and should be criticized mm. on their own merit what kind of philosophy they introduce 
what kind of politics they condone. And there is no danger in opening a book and reading a few words. And like, it can't ensorcel you. And this is the kind of, like, because like you said, people, some people genuinely believe that, that like opening any book that is deemed dangerous is going to like turn you evil or it's going to give you wrong ideas and it is getting books banned in libraries and like in in america they have to be like just getting books away from schools because the school board didn't approve them and it's like like you can you you can read any book and then see what you feel about it it's like give your set of personal beliefs a proper workout it's it's good for them so i I... <laughs> yeah, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying it's in a fictional context of a time when people would actually believe books would could possibly make people insane. Mm -hmm. The um, who was the famous playwright who was jailed for being a homosexual? Wild. And long time ago. Wild. Yes, well, one of his plays was banned because they thought if you watch this play, you would be sent insane. To the main character, after I go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying the the time period is written. And it's probably. Maybe might have freaked some people out with that concept. I think, yeah. I, I'm because people actually would believe that. Mm. Yeah, we're looking at it through a modern lens. I don't think that's kind of the right way to do it. But anyway, that's a good point. Actually, yeah. at the time it could have been exactly like that. So the main character Hildred, uh, he had a head injury. He fell from a horse. He was in an insane asylum. So right off the bat, they really try to drill home that this guy is probably not telling things as they are. Yes, and also that he believes he's not insane mm -hmm. as well no, of course yeah and he says he's going to get even with the doctor once he gets out of this place as well but does he yeah well that's a good discussion point at the end we don't know i, I was hoping he would <laughs> well i think there's a big clue at the end why did he did oh but i missed anyway. that so that's i'm very curious about all these things i i'm sure i missed because i was constantly uh, when does it What's, how am I supposed to know what's true? What does matter? Did anything even happen? Like I had all these questions. So. Well, as well, you, you've missed the point that the, the first story is set in 20 years into the future. Hmm. But is it? Probably... Yeah, that's another thing. I was like, is it yeah. actually? So, so like we said, it takes place in like an alternate history US. I guess, like Christina said, it's kind of a bad place to be, even though they seem like it's a society that improved much but they also talk about these suicide booths <laughs> which is very concerning and uh, the government's introduced to something called the lethal chamber yeah they talk about that the number of people committing suicides are too much and then prevent that we have introduced government they don't want to prevent it they want to help them on like like if uh, that's what i meant to say yeah yeah it's it's well, like to... yeah just what you want a government to do just not not give a shit at all just like Canada. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, they, go, they said that anybody who can't sort of bear the burden of life can have a peaceful death. You know, this was a time as well where like, we didn't really have much knowledge about sort of psychiatric treatment kind of thing. So maybe they considered that to be like a humane way to deal with people who were mentally ill or couldn't handle life. So is this supposed to be a comment on the main guy being insane and thinking of, of killing himself? No, this is probably the lethal chambers are probably not even real. That's what, yeah, I thought so. They could be just like subway station or something or a phone booth or something like that. So it's him. So he's, he's guessing, just imagining things, which I wasn't sure at all. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like, which part is real of this? I think what? <laughs> Well, and also in the opening chapter, the things they mentioned that are going on and have been resolved or, you know, the Cuban crisis or things, mm -hmm. these were real life events happening in 1895 as well. Mm -hmm. So they're quite kind of topically relevant at the time. Fortunately, like we already established, I'm never informed, so I have no idea. <laughs> True. <laughs> that's why I went over my head. Because, okay. So the other character in this story that's very interesting is uh, Mr. Wild, mm -hmm. the repairer of reputations. He's got it on his on his door. He's a deformed man. He's got a cat that's trying to maul him to death. <laughs> <laughs> which I, which makes me sure this is why Paul likes this book. <laughs> I thought it was funny, like this cat just like attacking his face and stuff, and he's got all these scratches and stuff all over him and he's got these like wax ears that are sort of attached to his head and he's 
head's really weird, but he's got like really powerful arms or something as well. Like this, it's like a really weird description. Very strange. So, yes. Yeah. You must also miss a point that while Hildridge was in the asylum, he probably read, he did read The King oh, yeah, of Yodel. Yeah. That's yes. a good point. That's, that's important. Mm. Yes. <laughs> During my convalescence, I had bought and read for the first time The King in Yellow. I remember after finishing the first act that it occurred to me that I had better stop. I started up and flung the book into the fireplace. The volume struck the barred gate and fell open on the hearth in the firelight. If I had not caught a glimpse of the opening words in the second act, I should never have finished it. But as I stooped to pick it up, my eyes became riveted to the opening page, and with a cry of terror, or perhaps it was a joy of so poignant, that I suffered in every nerve. I snatched the thing out of the coals and crept shaking to my bedroom, where I read it and reread it, and wept and laughed and trembled with a horror which at times assails me yet. This is the thing that troubles me, for I cannot forget Carcosa, where black stars hang in the heavens, where the shadows of men's thoughts lengthen in the afternoon, where the twin suns sink into the lake of Hala, and my mind will bear forever the memory of the pallid mask. So what happens? Maybe I shouldn't be the person describing this. But uh, so what does Hildred want to do? He wants, he wants to become the emperor. Of exactly. America. Why does he want to do that? Just to get power or what? He's got that book that he keeps reading and uh, he's got a vision. Yeah. Please, please, you guys go ahead. I feel like I'm very bad at doing things. So Mr. Wilde has the uh, sort of the ancestry of the United States or Hildridge will become the emperor of the US serving the king in Yolo. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's just all purely made up in his the head. They're both nuts. Hmm. Yeah. So this is clearly two insane people. <laughs> in that sense, I liked it. Like if I was sure from the very beginning that all of it is insanity, which I was trying to find what's not insanity there is that uh there, there is that detail where like y when you finish reading that story and you're like okay so they were all insane none of it was true but then you go okay what about the other characters uh that can either confirm or deny what actually is happening mm. in the story and you've got that armorer person father of constance and and uh so apparently Wilde does have some information pertinent to uh, mm -hmm. the armor and his and his daughter because they both get really shady when Hildred starts talking about this like uh, whatever title and blah and and then uh, oh the the armor the prince something armor it's in that street and then it really is in that street so like mm. yeah it, Wild just guess, or did he really have some inside information? That that was interesting. He might have knew where it was, or something like that, or planted it. I mean, yeah, this is like this is the interesting, fun part about the book, where you can discuss these things, I think, um, and speculate about, you know, why does he know something that's real, and then he's imagining that he's got all these people working for him, like he's got like, 800 employees or something, and they don't work for very much. And, you know, he's going through the newspaper saying, well, oh, this guy, I repaired his reputation for $50 or this guy for $100 and things like this. Hmm. So, yeah, it, it's it's all over the place. But I don't know. I just found it intriguing like that. So yeah. there is also uh, Hildred's cousin, Louis, mm. or Louis. Not sure. Louis. Louis. Is it? And uh, he has the birthright to be the king because reasons. He's in the line of succession. I wasn't sure why. He's the first in line. He's the, uh, because he's the oldest, or how does this work? He's his cousin, so it's like male cousin. Okay. Mm. So and also, if he marries Constance, she and the Armorers, well, she's the daughter of the Armorer. Um, that brings in England into the play. Okay. So he doesn't want that conflict at the moment. Uh, okay. Or what he imagines would be the conflict, because we don't actually know if mm. she's like the daughter of the armor or the d daughter of a marquis of wherever, right? And uh, so. Yeah, he kind of knows something about it, yeah. Mm. Basically, Hildred wants Louis to either like go away or and to never marry or to never marry, and uh, then he snaps. And when when he like they start planning like the the coup. Uh, that that he wants to like murder Louis and uh, murder Constance, murder the armor, but then that never happens, and instead he's dragged away while uh, Wild had been 
murdered by his cat. Uh, yeah, that was a surprise. Yeah, and then, then he'll. <laughs> That's just, how I want to go out. Kill anyway. The cat mm. and, like, okay. Poor, poor animal. On he a looks so fed up, Vinti. Yeah. Yeah, he, he is crazy. We got that. And uh, then he's dragged away and story's over. Yeah, 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 exactly. When he's confronting Lewis, telling him he has to go into exile or, you know, and renounce the crown and he shows him the documents to prove that, you know, he's in line of succession. Uh, Lewis is reading it and he, he says at one point, like, he's reading it and it's like, this is rubbish. Like, clearly, like, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. that is, is nonsense, yeah. So. Kind of humors him, he agrees to it at first. Yeah. Yeah. You feel really sorry for him, actually, because the cousin's actually quite kind to him and trying to be really nice to him and trying to humor him and mm. actually he's quite sympathetic to him. I felt sorry for Hildred, too. I felt yeah. sorry for Hildred, too, because he's clearly not a well man. And the yeah. the place where he lives, whether it is, like, to what degree the way he sees it is real or not, it's clear that the insane asylum wasn't very, very good to him. Yeah. I want to say I like the scene with the gold crown that uh, Hildred was putting on his on his head and the uh, cousin was watching him and he was like trying to safely put it back in the safe and from their different points of view it was very awkward and very <laughs> very tense at the same time. So I like that. that so he has well. this electric uh, time safe where he pulls out this beautiful elaborate gold crown with diamonds and everything on it. and. He puts it on his head and when the timer sounds again, he has to put it back into the safe. And when his cousin comes in, he's like, what are you doing with that like <laughs> copper thing around your head and the tinsel thing? It's it's clearly just a, you know, it's a, yeah. the fantasy of putting on a paper crown around your head. I think it's really good at using the medium of being a written story really well in the sense of a mad character. If it was a movie, it wouldn't work at all. Or if it was like any other kind of like a comic book or something. So I appreciate it for that. It's like well written in the sense of portraying things that cannot be portrayed in any other way. Because, for example, this scene with the crown, I cannot imagine how this would work in any well any other way than just a book. <laughs> or yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So I like that part. Okay. There was you're wondering if he actually did kill the doctor or not. Well, I think on the last line. It says, editor's note, Mr. Castain died yesterday in the asyl asylum for the criminally insane. So, okay. I think that's kind of a, a maybe. Yeah, decent hint to that. Oh, so he maybe he killed him. He was yes. planning murder, so maybe they were mm. like, okay, let's just put him, put him away for good. Poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> for me, it was lots to think about and feeling very bad about myself, not being able to understand anything. But did, did we change your mind a bit, Christina, or do you still feel the same about it? No, I, I, I feel the same about it. I like the, I, I enjoyed the, first taking movie the the most, as as much as I was uh, able. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now that's like I didn't want to disappoint. No, you. I have read like a plenty of stuff that I then had to like discuss, mm. and and that I didn't particularly enjoy, uh, and uh, like it's a. It's good to read stuff that's not always your taste. So second story is The Mask, and this one is much shorter. It had so much potential. Yeah, I was actually very intrigued at the beginning again. And then I was, once again, I, I guess it's with all of these stories. It's like, I'm really into it, and then something happens, and it's done. And I'm like, okay. So, okay, I, I would be, I'm willing to be invested and then it just cuts me off. And I was like, why didn't this go somewhere else? Like, just spent a little more time using these things you've set up, please. That's how I felt about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so three friends, uh, they are all artists. It's Alec, Genevieve and Boris. It's a painter, sculptor and somebody else. I guess the main character, Alec, is he an artist? He is a painter, I think. I don't know if Jin yes. does okay. anything besides... I didn't think she did. ...fall yeah. in love with people. <laughs> mm. So they have this strange liquid in a, in a pool, or I guess... Boris it, does. Yeah, mm. Boris is a sculptor. He's found something. He found like a new way to make sculptures and it just turns things, plants, living things into stone or marble or something. Into marble. Mm -hmm. And they describe uh, when it's turned into stone, how we can see the veins and the details of the tissue or something. It looks very intriguing mm -hmm. and beautiful. So he is, uh, Boris is experimenting with it and he turns a flower or like a plant into stone. And then, of course, the next step is a living animal. So they want to try it on a rabbit. And because Alec is very squeamish, what, uh, what other thing could he do than to 
sit somewhere else and read the king's king in yellow <laughs> it's a yeah. good pastime <laughs> so while he does that uh they turn the rabbit into stone and they admire it and blah blah and after that both genevieve and alec turn sick like they yeah they get a fever isn't they they think. both get very yeah. ill and they describe how ill they get and how they can't even do anything which was a very strange part of the story it's because of the king. i didn't see the i guess yeah Maybe she read it. <laughs> Genevieve is being super creepy. Uh, she she keeps telling everybody they she, she loves them, and then it culminates into her walking in the pool and turning herself into stone mm-hmm. because she's mad. Boris kills himself because he's mad. And they hide it. Sorry. Or they cover her up. Boris's suicide. And they say it's a heart attack or something. Yeah. Oh, okay. For some reason. And then after Alec, the main character, kind of recovers, he goes to see what happened and he finds that Genevieve is revived because after some while some after a while the takes a bit longer than comes that. back to life. Yeah, but basically any yeah. any anything that had been turned to stone by that uh, magical liquid is revived and and the story ends just as Genevieve wakes up, which I think hmm. wastes a lot of potential of the of the anguish. Right? That, that, I was waiting for you to say that. <laughs> that. That Alec and Genevieve and Jack, the the other person in in the story, that they they would feel as like, oh shit, Boris killed himself because he thought that mm. he had been responsible for Genevieve dying by inventing this uh, this hellish liquid, and uh, yeah. and then but the story just ends. And I was uh, here's so here's what I thought would happen. I was really excited at mm. the start of the story because uh, the the Alec, the narrator, mentions that Boris is an extremely successful sculptor, and he had and just just he got a lot of acclaim um, from this one sculpture of Genevieve that he had made. That sculpture is very important; it comes back symbolically later. And I thought, oh, this is going to be this kind of uh, war within himself, with like the does the egoistic artist win him wanting to mm. measure up to his masterpiece until he actually ends up turning a person to stone on purpose or, mm. or is he going to be able to say okay maybe i will never measure up to my previous masterpiece but then it just genevieve walks in herself and oh that's so much went like wasted potential they could have that little boy that uh, Alec was painting, who wouldn't sit still. I thought, "Ooh, he is going to end up I in was the sure, yeah. I so sure, yeah. Wasn't. <laughs> they just, he, so, I was sure that would gonna have this. Yeah. I, I thought, like, okay, they're going to go insane. Let's do. You going in the bath? But but then just, it's like none of that happens, and I'm like, oh well, I guess it was just that book that made them crazy. Yeah, none in none of the internal struggle, just the. Just the book. Yeah, I wanted murder. I didn't get the part when Boris killed himself and Jenny fell into, uh, walked into it. I was like, what? It, I guess the answer is madness. But I, I wish there would be more motive. Something. So. There was um, one other thing that ties the first story and the second story together as well. Not the book. Boris. <laughs> no, Boris. He does mention uh, the Ankenstein, right? Oh uh, no, that's later in the last one. Oh, sorry. That's in the. The yellow sign. Uh, no, this one, Boris is a sculpture of the fates that is sort of outside the uh, lethal chamber. Oh. Lethal chamber. The suicide booth has... Yeah. So the lethal chamber... Sculpture of the fates. Do exist. We that, I, I remember reading that. We do, do have that confirmed in the second story. So it's not just uh, Hildred's like, crazy stuff because uh, the yeah they confirm it in this one. All right. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, there you go. Once, once again, I wasn't hating it. I wasn't this like disliking it or being bored with it. I was just like, okay. Yeah. This is probably my least favorite of the mm. four. The Court of the Dragon. That was my least favorite. I kind of like this one too. Really? For the length. Most mm. boring chase scene through the cities of Paris. And then, oh, it was a dream. Okay. <laughs> what was it? I should have recorded this on video. Yes. All, these, all these facial expressions both of you are having, it's, it's well, I'm, I'm, I, I Look, I think the problem for me with these stories is that I'm the wrong target. I'm not the target audience for it. Because for me, it takes quite a leap to believe in this primordial evil. In this, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that like there is some kind of a just original evil that 
like a separate entity, right? It t takes a, quite a big leap for me to believe that, okay, this is an actual Satan-like character that is like actually evil. And so it's not terrifying for me. For me, what would be terrifying would be the people having to battle their own, you know, their own, their own madness, their own ego, their own desire and uh yeah but but this is just like an external entity that makes them act a certain way so in a way they it's kind of a cop out for them because it's not <laughs> them really doing it it's that it's their book making them do it and since i don't really believe in the book just left like okay I think you're doing exactly what I was doing on the episode with Paul and Lovecraft. I am looking into it in from very modern point of view and I'm asking the story to be so much more that nowadays stories are and it's not really fair because it came out in 1865. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like it I I would need a little bit more of a like push from the author to really believe in the in the book the way the way that he presents it as as just a done deal and uh, you don't really you don't really actually see someone going going mad it's just like hmm. they read the book there it is they're like illness sickness madness done uh and i i would need a little bit more from the character like you know shown as as they are you know descending into madness for me to really buy that yes this uh this book it is scary that's that's me I, and i i completely understand if somebody like doesn't need to take that leap because it's like yeah why not but okay I want to say I was 100% uh, sure that especially this story would tie back to the other story somehow that the person pursuing him or something else would be something else from the other stories like I was uh, kind of expecting like one of the characters to turn up again or something like being the pursuer or or somebody pretending to be the king uh, in yellow and then doing something bad anyway we never said what happened so <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. to sum, just to sum up. Sorry, Paul. Do you want to say something? No, just no. I was going to say the character in this one. I think I I speculate that he's the character in the the fourth story, but that's just my speculation. Oh, okay. But, so maybe yeah. there's something to mm. could be. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think maybe maybe my imagination is just too good. Much better than ours. <laughs> I can just fill in the gaps with fantasy and i don't know I, I i find it it's just a stimulation i don't want to be spoon fed too much i guess i i don't know i it makes sense yeah. it are makes you sense. are you saying yeah, for... we are wrong for not liking the stories no i'm just <laughs> are you saying I'm we are trying to say for not getting the stories i was thinking how can i word this in the most gentle way <laughs> possible yeah. you know what you meant do we though <laughs> <laughs> maybe you don't yeah. yeah, I can see that. I, I like it for that part. Okay, so the Court of the Dragon. It's a real place, too. <laughs> yeah, it's a real place, you know. I summed it up as the dullest chase sequence through the city of Paris that might or might not ah. be the dream. But was it? Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the narrator, he's in the church and he's very troubled because he's been reading the King mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's gone to the church to find solitude. And he usually likes the music or the organ playing in this church. But this time, the organ player is like really quite off-putting. Yeah, the description. The, the music's... Like yeah. That. And he, he catches sights of the organ player. And he's he describes him as like that horror movie thing, the Slender Man kind of thing. <laughs> My eyes turned, I knew not why, towards the lower end of the church. The organist was coming from behind the pipes and passing along the gallery on his way out. I saw him disappear by a small door that leads to some stairs which descend directly to the street. He was a slender man, and his face was not white as his coat was black. Good riddance, I thought. With your wicked music, I hope your assistant will play the clause involuntary. And the organist sort of disappears off the stage, and then he appears again at the back, and it's sort of like, how did he do that? Sort of go around the church so quickly, it's impossible. He's feeling very uncomfortable in the church and he decides that he, the organist is looking at him with such sort of hate and he decides, I've got to get out of here. So he escapes from the church and he mentions that the slender, well, the organ player sort of brushes him out on the street and walks past him. 
and his sort of body felt like iron inside a loose black covering. And then he decides to go back to the place of residence where he lives, the court of the dragon. But the organ player is basically stalking him. The thing which he had threatened had arrived. It gathered and bore down on me from the fathomless shadows. The point from which it would strike was his infernal eyes. Hopeless, I set my back against the barred doors and defied him. There was a scraping of the chairs on the stone floor and a rustling of the congregation rose. I could hear the Swiss staff in the south aisle preceding Monsignor C to the sacristy. And suddenly he wakes back up in the church. and says, oh, wait, I've lost time or that was a dream or he's not sure. He's, he's very confused by the situation. Mm. You remember, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember. Go on, say it. <laughs> uh, I crept to the door. The organ broke out overhead with a blare. A dazzling light filled the church. Bolting the altar from my eyes, the people faded away. The arches, the vaulted roof vanished. I raised my seared eyes to the fathomless glare, and I saw the black stars hanging in the heavens, and the wet winds from the lake of Hala chilled my face. And now, far away, over leagues of tossing clouds, waves, I saw the moon dripping with spray, and beyond the towers of Carcosa rose behind the moon. Death and the awful abode of lost souls, whither in my weakness long ago had sent him, had changed him for every other eye but mine. And now I heard his voice rising, swelling, thundering through the flaring light, as I felt the radiance increasing, increasing poured over me in waves of flame. Then I sank into the depths, and I heard the king in yellow whispering in my soul, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living god. <laughs> Very well said. <laughs> Thank you. I like this one. I, it was, this wasn't my least favorite. I, I think it was, uh, for the length, it was very well put together. Like, it was so short, but it, it, it told a story that was intriguing, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, as I said, I like that point of where you think someone's in danger, and they're like, oh, it's happy ending, it's safe, and then, oh, he's in danger again, and it's happy end. It's like that, it's a, it's a good sort of horror strategy of sort of pulling you into danger, then putting you back into safety, and pulling you in, and pulling you out. No, no, no. I did not feel it's... like it was a cop out with the dream. I felt like it was more than that. I wasn't sure if it was a dream, though. So. Yeah, me neither. Hmm. I think the Lovecraftians really loved that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of living God, right? <laughs> it, it made me roll my eyes when I read it. Like, as the ending was like, oh, okay. You should never read anything like I don't. Uh... Yeah, I was going to say that before. Maybe, maybe it would get me in, in the mood. I don't know. It's uh, it very much depends on the on the writing, and this didn't. I, I was talking to... to Adam about this exact point. Uh, Adam likes these stories, kind of like some of them he loves and some of them he hates. And this aspect he likes, he he hates very much. And he read the the Mountains of Madness, or something mm. like that. <laughs> and he was so mad, and he kept saying there were all these lines, and uh, every single chapter it ended. The fearful thing is to fall into the mountains of madness. And then <laughs> the next chapter was like, and we entered the mountain of madness and yeah. he was so mad he was like this this story actually drove me mad i hate mountains of madness so much and they say it one more time and it's gonna flip out <laughs> so he, he agrees so yeah but i liked it yeah, i don't mind i liked it too i thought it was like nice atmosphere happy, mm. happy to be the voice of dissension <laughs> <laughs> you'll meet you soon <laughs> I told you you're needed on this on this episode mm. because so the last one is the yellow sign which I uh, hope and beg you Paul don't be an artist that goes mad have you ever painted somebody yet yeah I did in art school many times okay. yeah, so um... when you start painting people mm. maybe I'll be your model oh god but then what if <laughs> what if suddenly like the the skin on the painting turns unhealthy when before it was healthy. And now suddenly it is unhealthy. What if that happens? You've never tried mixing yellow before, have you? <sighs> <laughs> and this color yellow is actually very important in this time period. It's just, it's a, I see a smirk on her face. Um, it's an art thing. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> no, that, that is actually, I, I want to know more. Because like, yeah, tell me more about paint. It's a sign of, uh, the, no, the, the yellow color. Or there was a pigment called the King's Yellow, um, which was kind of very expensive. Oh, um, so know. it was a, a color of decadence kind of thing that was sort of popular in the period. I but see. also, as I said, mixing yellow is it's really easy to contaminate and really easy to get muddy very quickly. I can kind of get it. So mm -hmm. that, that, no, that, that like 
gives me new appreciation of Van Gogh. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but the, the narrator in this one, Mr. Harris, I think. Oh, no, Mr. Scott, sorry. Yes. It, it's clearly Chambers. Is it? Yeah. He's inserted himself into the story. Uh, okay. Didn't cross my mind at all. He was an artist living in Paris, so, you know. An author self-insert. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so Scott and Tessie are the characters. How old is Tessie? Is he a creep? What happened? You can't look at it through your modern lens, Philip. It was a different time. <laughs> okay, he was a creep then. <laughs> what you're saying <laughs> so he keeps painting this tessie girl naked and she's a model yes it's yeah. a it's a profession yeah, yes just mm. just playing it up but yes mm -hmm. so she's a model but only him is the painter there are no other people involved as far as i understood like not in this one though no. he falls for her and she does too in time and then they get together but in the meantime he gets us a, a present which is the yellow sign Right? Yeah, you've really skipped forward, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. No, he doesn't fall for her. He kind of he kind of makes a mistake. He sort of she is hot. She, yeah, and she says that she cares for him, and he said, "Oh, I should have just sort of brushed it off or made a joke." But he kind of yeah. kisses her, and then suddenly he's like, "Oh no, what have I done?" Yeah, hmm. it's kind of ironic because after he kisses her, um, she's a nude model, but. The next day when she comes in, she doesn't want to get nude in front of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was an interesting scene. I, I like that. Uh, typical, anyway. But it, like, it's it's <laughs> better if if he, you know, is the one to introduce her into the world of uh, romance and love uh, because he will not tarnish her reputation too bad. So he's actually doing a good thing by, by like, he's taking on a burden like this that's kind of the way he phrases it is like ah yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna fuck her up a bit but uh because because i'm not a good man so i'm it's she's she's not she's not gonna be happy in the end but like somebody else could fuck her up worse so i suppose i must sacrifice myself since she fences me yeah and he keeps going on about how he's such a like sort of scumbag artist kind of thing that's what artists are like kind of thing it's like really <laughs> yeah but but mm. selfless in a way you know mm. yeah <laughs> But then he makes another comment about how he would prefer to be with the other guys or something as well. I think the romance was written that badly in this, actually. But uh, uh, Lovecraft could never do this at all. So That's true. That's much better than Lovecraft. The, yeah. the relationships. Can, can I read characters. one line, one one sentence from, from the whole that, that I was like, okay, I want to know more. Or like, this is an mm. excellent line, excellent information. Tessie Rose unrolled her scented handkerchief and taking a bit of gum from a knot in the hem placed it in her mouth i was like oh this is the best line in all of this because that it it never would have occurred to me that this is something that people did this is such a show of of like humanity and information about a time that like we have no way of accessing anymore it's like yeah like in paris girls would have been carrying their chewing gum in in their handkerchiefs and it's like okay a little bit gross but i love knowing that fact that made me really happy to read <laughs> which i completely get that's not the point of the story the point of the st story is that there is an extremely ugly man who might be dead uh or actually yeah he is dead not it no might be dead, about it yeah. and and like oh he is ugly and and evil and uh you pick up all those lines of chewing gum and I didn't even notice. But I, I like the description of that man at the beginning. Whatever it was about that man that repelled me, I did not know. But the impression of a plump white grave worm was so intense and nauseating that I must have shown it in my expression. For he turned his puffy face away with a movement which made me think of a disturbed grub in a chestnut. I was like, ugh. <laughs> so. Very interesting. I, I appreciated it. So this is the night watchman who's taking care of the church from his window that he can see. Tessie has a dream and she imagines she's seen the hearse driver uh, who is the night watchman, the ugly, grubby looking worm man. I think I remember now. And she tells the painter that I had a dream. He was pulling a hearse or driving a hearse and you were in the coffin at the back, but you weren't dead. You were in the coffin, staring out of the coffin. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Mm. Okay. So the next day, when Tessie comes in, the painter tells her he had a dream as well. And this time that he was in the coffin looking out and he could imagine Tessie from her window watching the hearse driving past and he was like look see this is how you know dreams kind of or stories influence other people's dreams and she's like but i i had exactly the same dream last night as you did and so that's when she starts to kind of freak out that's when she says oh i care about you and that's when he kind of kisses her am i jogging anyone's memory yeah okay we're completely with you all right and then the bellboy uh i think the next day or something he comes in uh i think his name's thomas and he was telling him, the painter, what's his name? Mr. Scott? Scott, I keep forgetting, yeah, Mr. Scott. Okay. That he was out, he's like this cockney kid, and he's out with some other girls, and they come across the Night Watchman, and he's so repulsed and angered by him that he hits him, and he said his face was all like cold and mushy thing. And then the, the Watchman grabs his hand, and then Thomas pulls his hand away and pulls one of his fingers off and just comes clean off. Well, Do you remember that? This part. Yeah, 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 it does. And then Mr. Scott sees him the next day, and oh, the finger is missing. He says, well, sir, it's got truth that when I grabbed his wrist, sir, and when he twisted his soft, mushy one, all his fingers came off on me. And it was awful. I just ran away like it made me ill. There you go. That's my Cockney. Awesome. <laughs> I like a good Cockney a character. So, and, and that... The bellboy too, he was like a, a war veteran or something, so he's not like a coward or anything, but the guy repulsed him so much that he, he, he couldn't stand being around him and just ran away from him. Anyone else remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so while during one session, Tessie's feeling a bit naughty, so she steals a, a book. And, uh, oh, I skipped over how she gives him the symbol, didn't I? Yes, yeah. you skipped over another book. Yeah. But... So uh, he gives her a little cross and then she gives him the black onyx symbol. So it's inlaid with a sort of a symbol letter on gold, but it's neither Arabic or Chinese. Um, it's no human kind of script. But she said she found it. She didn't buy it. So And one day when he's moving some canvases or something, he injures his hands. He's got nothing to do and he's kind of frustrated. And so he's looking for a new book in his bookshelves. And there's one up on one of the top shelves that he hasn't seen before. And he asked her, Tessie, to, can you get that down? She gets it. And he's like, what is that? And she's like, it's the king in yellow. He's like, what? I didn't buy this. I don't have it in my house. I never oh would have read it. God. And he said he knows about the awful tragedy of the young Castain. And he mentions from the first story. And that prevented him from ever kind of refusing to have anything to do with the book. Tessie runs away. She hides herself. He's saying, don't read it. Please don't open it. And she just disappears somewhere in the house. He finds her later. She's sort of just sort of catatonic sitting there. And she's she has the book open in front of her. Uh, he moves her to another part of the house. And then he decides he will open the book and read it. I still like this part because it, it, it is a good description of them kind of going insane, I thought. And they sort of start talking to each other sort of telepathically. Um, it's almost like junkies sort of sitting there and they're all sort of wasted and zoned out. I thought it was really interesting. And she's communicating to him uh, about that yellow sign that the onyx thing he found. Because the watchman one night when he, uh, Mr. Scott was walking home, mumbled something to him. And he was like, I don't know what he said. And then realized later what the night watchman said was, have you found the yellow sign? Mm. So during their telepathic crazy conversation, she's begging him to throw it away, throw it into the fire, but he's refusing to do it. And then... They hear the hearse or the car come. It's the uh, the night watchman and the king in yellow. And he comes in, he grabs the doors and the doors sort of, the bolts will rot at his touch. There's a big scream. People come into the house and they find that there's one dead body and, oh, sorry, two dead bodies as in Tessie has died from fright uh, of seeing the king in yellow. And the night watchman who seem to be have um, been dead for months, apparently. It was only when I felt him envelop me in his cold, soft grasp that I cried out and struggled with a deadly fury, but my hands were useless as he tore the onyx clasp from my coat and struck me full in the face. Then, as I fell, I heard Tessie's soft cry and her spirit fled to God. Even while falling, I longed to follow her, for I knew that the king in Yolo had opened his tattled mantle and there was only Christ to cry to now. So I, I thought the Night Watchman was maybe the, the guy from the, the Court of the Dragon at no. the end. No, no, that's just my speculation, but anyway. It could be. Mm. 
Mm. Nothing denying it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. But when you tell it like that, I, I, I see why you like it. So he, the narrator, Mr. Scott, he's sort of writing this and he says the last line, he says, I think I'm dying. I wish the priest would and just stops there. So did you first read or listen to this? By the way, I, I read I read mm. this. Yeah, I, I listened to it. Yeah, I was sure because the audio sounds much better than <laughs> the text sounds. <laughs> Maybe the audio amplifies it. Yeah, it's free on YouTube, by the way. If anybody's listening and curious, yeah, it's in the public domain. Yeah, so uh, and it's very well read, mm. kind of acted. So it gives much more depth to the emotions of the characters. Was that on uh, Horror Bab? Maybe I just searched oh, okay. and it popped up on YouTube. Okay, that's probably the most famous one, I think. Yeah, it's it's quite well produced, I think. So that's actually why I re-listened to the story again because it was much more enjoyable than than just reading it. When when I was reading it, it was kind of dry, okay. was like whatever. Mm-hmm. And when I stopped and thought about it, I kind of liked it. But I was like, yeah. okay, whatever. And then when I listened to it, it was more like a dramatic reenactment, like a more mm. like the way it was read sounded mm. really nice. So it was more engaging. Yeah. So if you're interested, I should have said this at the beginning. I would recommend listening than reading. Actually. Might have. Yeah, I would recommend the Ho- Horror Bubble channel for it. He does a really good production of it. Um, and right now as well, like when you said it, <laughs> it sounds so much better when you talk about it than when you read it. <laughs> you persuaded me that it's it's uh, better than I thought at first. So I would still recommend yeah. it. Like it's not bad. It's just a very specific style of story. But yeah, maybe listen to it. Maybe, maybe not that, read that it. could help. Yeah, yeah. Like, like you have to first. You have to be sold on the concept of the book being evil. Unless you can accept that as a <laughs> as, as a thing, you're you're not gonna have a good time. But once you do, if you do, then yeah. I think if if you like anything with reference to the Necronomicon, you'd like this because it's the same concept, even an evil book. I'm glad I read it. I wasn't put off by any means. I was just a little bit, I guess I was, I'm just, I'm not gonna lie, I'm just exhausted from work lately, so I was kind of out of it at parts. And when I read it on the train after work or going to work, I was just like, what happened? <laughs> Let me read that again. <laughs> so that might be an indication of all oh, the stuff I missed, but I still liked it. Yeah, okay. at least somebody did. Yeah. Uh, I, I was, you know, not not tired when I read it. I'm not overwhelmed by work. So, yeah. You might just not like it, you know, but it's okay. And it's okay to love it because people have different tastes and people are going to get different stuff out of it. I was kind of like, I know that uh, equating uh, beauty with goodness is a par for the course for the, for the time period. Very much so. But I, I was a bit annoyed by... Uh, how it was like oh look at him he is so ugly he's so ugly that i think he is evil and it might be best to kill him like that that is the general vibe of the of that's like that, that's carried through the the four stories like yeah not not pretty he's enough basically a zombie though die, isn't he yeah yeah but he might not be you know what if what if <laughs> he just has some kind of a disease the poor dude and he's just not pretty and and people look at him and they go like yeah you you, you smell and uh you're you're not pretty and actually we're gonna punch you because it makes us so angry because that is what makes the bellboy angry the the uh the ugly dude he's just sitting there minding his own business maybe looking at them that is what he's doing and the bellboy and his girlfriend and his pal and his girlfriend they're, they're walking past and he's looking at them and the bell, bellboy just feels so scared and so furious that that he attacks him uh, and it's like okay i i can so like once you accept that yes he is evil that is a reasonable course of action if you have a doubt in your mind that like yeah maybe he is just a really ugly guy <laughs> Funny. <laughs> I meant to say, uh, I meant to tell you an incident that happened to me, and maybe now it's explained finally why that happened. I was about 15 or maybe about that, a teenager with my friend Peter, and we used to go running into this forest like place running track, and we were crossing the road, and the car stopped, and the guy <laughs> opened the window, and he looked at us. It was like two guys, like I don't know, older people kind of, <laughs> and I think mean, they were playing a joke or something. But the guy opened the window and he said, come over here, come over here, you, you, come over here. You're so ugly. And then he looked at me 
<laughs> I was standing behind Peter and he said, and you, you're even fucking uglier. Get out of here. And I never understood why or what happened or what the hell was that about. So he just left and you're like, what? But now I know. They both read it. They read the King in Yellow. That's what happened. So with this nonsense, let's finish <laughs> fighting. Well, thanks so much, uh, Paul, for finding or ma making me read this. I always appreciate it. I always say this, but I really mean it. I would have never read it otherwise. And I okay. I didn't dislike it. And it was really interesting. And uh, thank you, Christina, for still being here. I kind of can't believe it. So hopefully it's not the last time. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me come this the book and taking it in such good grace. <laughs> of course. And uh, if it actually works out, we've just planned a book that's coming out this year. That's the first on this podcast we want to do. That's my resolution for this year. So see you then, at least for that book and hopefully for more. Thank you very much for listening. Please rate us on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Spotify, Google Podcasts and all that shares. And on the next episode, we are trying to break out of our reading habits. And we're going to read a supposedly super dark, edgy comedy with a nice book cover called My Sister, the Serial Killer by Oyinkan Braithwaite. Is it a comedy though? Join us next time to find out. <laughs> <laughs>